Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to this workshop at GYC Europe entitled A Unique Responsibility. I'd like to invite you to bow your heads for a word of prayer as we begin. Father in heaven, as we delve into this subject, as we look into your word, as we look into our history, as we look into who we are as a people, I pray that you would speak through me. I pray you would speak to our heart and give us a clearer understanding to our position, our place, and our role in the world today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The question is often asked, what religion are you? The answer is given, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. And then the question comes, well, either what's that? And then we may explain that we're a Christian denomination, etc. And a follow-on question or connected to that question is, well, what do you believe or what makes you different or what is what are you all about answers are sometimes given well we're like other churches except we keep the sabbath or we're waiting for jesus to come and we believe in the sabbath or we believe in a health message we live to you know six to eight years longer than the rest of the population or we come up with certain answers that sometimes answer unique parts as to who we are as a people but who are we what makes us different the Adventist church has a relatively short history when compared to other denominations. The Catholic church will claim to go back for, you know, a thousand or 2000 years. Uh, other Christian denominations, Protestant mainstream denominations, such as the Church of England, they go back to the 1500s. The Methodist church goes back to the late 1700s. The, the Baptist to the 16, 1700s. The, the, the Presbyterian goes back to the the 1500s. The Lutheran church goes back to the 1500s. These are mainstream denominations and they have maybe a 500 year history or, or maybe slightly less, but the Adventist church only has a history that goes back to the 1860s, around 150, 160 uh, years of official organization as a denomination. Why raise up a new church when there were already other Christian denominations around? And, and what is our purpose? What, do, what makes our doctrine and purpose unique? We live in a world today that is plagued, you may say, with postmodernism. Postmodern is the idea in a very simplistic nutshell that there isn't really a truth out there that your truth is your truth, that my truth is my truth, and that we can both be right about any particular subject or, or, or issue. And we have to learn to see things from each other's angle, recognizing that neither of us is really right and neither of us is, is truly wrong. This idea that there are multiple answers to the question. This idea that everyone is in a sense right and everyone is a, a winner. These, this mindset is prevalent in society today and, and, and we need to know how to confront this and how to, um, how to meet with it. I'd like to share with you a, uh, I'm gonna share my screen right here. And, and uh, so unique responsibility. When we think about us as a church uh, today, we, we come onto a landscape that is full. It's full. This is just some pictures <laughs> pulled off the internet of different churches that are around. We live in a world that is full of various different denominations. So what makes us different? Adventists have been increasingly uncomfortable with the idea that there is a remnant church, that we are a unique people and that we are different today. Increasingly uncomfortable with it. I want you to I want to share some statistics with you and just to see a worrying slide. And even the latest statistics I'm sharing are are eight years old, but notice here, in 1998, this is going back, what is 1998? That is 20, 23 years ago. 
a report was given, why do Adventists quit coming to church? This was done by the Center of Creative Ministry, a, a think tank, so to speak, in our church. And what they found was this, three out of four people leave for reasons having to do with their relationships with other people and groups, and less than one in five leave because they no longer believe the teachings of the church. And this was the prevalent view. People leave the Adventist church not because they don't believe the Adventist church is the true church. So we used to, these, these statistics were common like 20 odd years ago, and people said, well, people still believe in the Adventist message, but they leave because they've had some interpersonal conflict in the church but but they still in their head theoretically and or theologically still believe in the teachings of the church they've just had disagreements therefore if we can solve those disagreements with former members if we can you know have uh, you know some healing and some restoration if, if we can be better at making friends etc cetera, etc cetera, we will lose less people as a church that was this this study was done in 1998 very few people indicated that they left because of a disagreement over doctrine. Many had questions and doubts, but no basic disagreements with the main tenets of the Adventist faith. And we said, oh, you know, this is good because it shows that even those who leave still believe in the Adventist message. They still believe in it, but, but, but they, they, they've just had problems along the way. Now, 1975, this goes back even further, uh, was a study of departing members, and they said there was absolutely no proof that anyone left the church because they no longer believed the doctrines. No proof. Now, that's like 40, what is that, 43, uh, or more than that, 46 or so years ago that that study was done. But Mark Finley in his book, Making Friends for God, that's probably 25 years old now. Same thing. You know, people need to make friends. They need to have eight friends in the church. And if they have eight friends in the church, there's less likelihood of leaving. We're answering the question as to what is the challenge people have today with this idea of uniqueness? This idea of uniqueness. Previous studies seem to show that as, as a church, we, we didn't question that idea of uniqueness so much. But maybe the changing landscape, maybe uh, as society has changed, we have seen differences come about. In 2013, there was an article that came out in the Adventist Review, March the 21st. And it was entitled, Former Seventh-day Adventist Perceptions of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It was a very interesting article and a very interesting study. And, and they found that of those who have left the church, of those who have left the church, Disagreement, so to speak, over doctrine was close to 50%, 49% of people. Lifestyle was only 10%, but and a bad experience was close to 40%, uh, on, uh, I believe 30, 38. Now, those are worrying statistics where doctrine and bad experience are the two highest things. Their lifestyle may, is not necessarily out of sync with the church, but Doctrinal disagreements and a bad experience with the people are the two main reasons why people no longer fellowship uh, with the church. There's another uh, breakdown, doct SDA doctrine, close to 70%. Judgmental attitude, close to 50%. A disagreement over Ellen White, 37%. Legalism, 15%. Legalism, 15%. Now, the article went on to say there are many SDA churches that are open, that are loving, that are focused on Christ. But this is not the problem. The problem is with the doctrine of the SDA church. The doctrinal beliefs of the SDA church are completely, this is a quotation from someone, are completely unbiblical. This is the reason I will never attend an SDA church again. This was, as I said, a survey, but they had different um Clip, uh, different testimonies of people in there and this was one of them another person said if adventism would catch hold of the truth of grace and it is finished it would be a great package it's in just missing something someone else said i cherish my memories of growing up in a warm family-based healthy safe environment independent bible study led me down a different path this is some of the quotations of the article. Now, where they agree and disagree was what I found most interesting. It went through all the doctrines. And then it asked whether you agree still or disagree with this. And, it looked, and there was a percentage number given. Those that agree with the life and death of Jesus, 71.58% of former Adventists says we still, be, um, 
We still agree with that. The Trinity, 71%. The Lord's Supper, communion, 65%. These are still relatively high numbers. Creation, 60, almost 65% of former Adventists still believe in the, the literal creation of the world. The second coming, 60%. We're still over the 50% threshold. The experience of salvation, 56%. Baptism, 57 the belief that in heaven there's going to be a new earth, 55%. Unity in Christ, 55%. Marriage, 55%. The death and resurrection, the belief that when you die, you go to the grave, you'll be resurrected later, 55%. Spiritual gifts, 52%. Now we're starting to go below the 50% threshold. Stewardship is still 50. Christian behavior, 48. The law of God, 47. The Sabbath, 45%. The millennium, 44. The great controversy, 44. Heavenly sanctuary, now we're getting even lower, only 40%. The church, the concept that you need a church. You know, today people say, I'm spiritual, but I don't need to go to a church. This idea that there needs to be a body of believers organized, structured on the earth, only 36% believe with, in that. The gift of prophecy, 36%. And the lowest, the lowest, the remnant church and its mission was only 28.95%, with 71% disagreeing with this doctrine. Now, now here's a challenge. Here's a challenge because the remnant church, the, the thing that makes us unique, the thing that makes us different, the remnant church, uh, our unique responsibility is the lowest thing that people agree with, the lowest thing the lowest thing and this should concern us this should concern us now what are the causes for this we have a unique responsibility in the world today what makes us different and if this idea of being a remnant church amongst former adventists is the is the um what shall i say is the point where they agree the least it's where there is the most disagreement on if that is the case if that is the case what does that say about those that still remain Maybe this is a question that even those who remain, we, we don't really fully understand as to why that is happening and, and what are the causes and what are the, the reasons for that taking place. Now, if we move on, move on to the next one. What are the causes of this concept of the remnant? What are the causes of that um, disagreement and, and uh, what shall I say, uncertainty about our beliefs? Some of the causes are this. Number one there is contact with other Christians. What are the contact we have with other Christians? Increasingly, um, evangelicals do not consider us to be evangelical or even Christian. Well, you're not really Christian. You know, going back to the 1950s, there were books written to say, you know, the kingdom of the cults. So the Adventist church was actually a cult. That plays into, that plays into a factor. What are some of the, of the reasons as, as to why... We have a challenge with accepting that we are a remnant. There's a temptation sometimes to modify our identity. There's accusation against, uh, raised against authors of the book Questions on Doctrine. There was a book Questions on Doctrine written in, in the 1950s that, that aimed to clarify what we believe as a church. And, and, and there were accusations that those who wrote that book were trying to twist some of the, the, the real specific points of Adventism, such as the heavenly sanctuary, such as the, uh, the nature of Christ, or some of these things, and to um, paper over some of these areas of strong disagreement with other churches. And so the accusation was that we were trying to minimize our differences. We're trying to minimize the idea that we were a remnant church. Other causes, I believe, of, of some of this is this idea that there's been an apparent delay over the second coming, that, that Jesus would have come um, if it were not for uh, certain things happening. And these all kind of compound and come together to give people this, this you know, if, if the Adventist church is a unique church, if the Adventist church is the remnant church, if it is uniquely positioned at the end of time for a specific purpose to usher in the second coming of Jesus, and the second coming of Jesus has not happened yet, then maybe there's a problem with the idea that we have of the remnant. Maybe that's the problem in and of itself. 
the remnant church as a last day message and, and, and because of institutionalization, because of delay, uh, the remnant is no longer the object of attack by Christians or, or civil powers. Now, we also live in a world today where people are less interested in religious matters. And this religious exclusiveness is not tolerated. As I mentioned, uh, I think I mentioned earlier, we live in a world today that is postmodern. We live in a world today where there's not really objective truth when it comes to the philosophical questions of life. Of course, gravity and, and things like that, no one, no one debates on. But when it comes to belief systems, it's about me understanding you and it's about you understanding me and it's about me accepting that, that your, your beliefs are truth to you. So why today we have who knows how many genders because people can identify as anything. That's, it's their identity, it's their truth, it's, it's who they are as a person. It's who they are as a person. People are not interested, so to speak, in, in, in religious matters. And, and, and so exclusivity in a world that's not religious is not tolerated. It's one thing to, to even be religious, but then to say that your religion and your beliefs are unique and need to be accepted by everyone, that's a, a pill too large for people to swallow. What has led to this? Well, you could argue it's a theological training of, of of ministers today where an increasing number of people are getting doctoral degrees or master's degrees from non-SDA schools. If you're getting your, if you're drinking at a certain fountain, it can impact how you see the world. And if, if you're doing dissertations on in areas that have to be critiqued by non-Adventist professors, you are less likely to be doing dissertations arguably, on the unique specifics of the faith, maybe on areas where it's, it's easier to, to defend yourself to a non-Adventist professor. We have a ministry or a, a teaching staff that are exposed to a diversity of ideas and, and various methods of interpretation. There are different ways of interpreting the scriptures, and Adventism was founded on historicism, and which is no longer uh, accepted in modern scholarship. Yet I believe the biblical text supports it. When we look at Daniel, when we look at Revelation, and we see these um, books of the Bible, we see how they're interpreted, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, where it looks at the past, it looks at the present, and it looks at the future. When we see how that all interplays and how that all works together, this is the root of Adventism, and yet this school of thought in modern scholastic circles is not really accepted as being cutting edge anymore. So if we as Adventists want to, in a sense, receive peer-reviewed um, articles that are respected across the field, we can't maybe use that as we try to. Under the influence of modern scholarship, some have rejected historicism. Thus, they have to redefine our identity and the concept of the remnant. If we're no longer using historicism, and then it takes away some of the arguments or some of the, the reasoning that we have used in the past from the books of Revelation, etc., to show that, that, that we, we have been raised up at a particular time and that we have a uniqueness about our message. Therefore, what makes us unique? Oh, well, maybe it's just about do we believe totally in Jesus or maybe, you know, something else that's more, more woolly, more fluffy, less specific. In some cases, we explain the foundation and function in purely so sociological terms. Well, we're just here to provide a health message or we're just here to help humanity. We're just here to, um, to ease suffering in the world. We're just here for, for these reasons. And, and that's the purpose of our existence. We're to just be the hands and feet of Jesus, so to speak. We're just to be the ones who are, you know, feeding the, 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 the suffering and so on, so on and so forth. And, and that's why we're here. Well, I believe all of those things are a reason why we're here, but they're not necessarily what makes us unique. As I mentioned already, what are the causes of this? One of the causes is modern worldviews that we have today. This idea that truth is relative. This idea that truth is relative. 
Therefore, our claim to be the remnant with a mission, with a mission to proclaim a message to every human being is foolish. And if that's foolish, we need to rewrite what our mission is. And that therefore leads to a redefining of our identity. If we no longer have to take a message that's been entrusted to us, like God entrusted the message to ancient Israel, he said, I've committed unto you the oracles of God. If we no longer have this message entrusted to us, that's precious to share to the world. Why are we here? If the gospel doesn't need to go to all the world, if God's character doesn't need to be vindicated, what is the purpose for us being here? What is the purpose? Are we just one piece of a puzzle and we're just to do our little part here? Or is our role truly a global role? These are the kind of questions we have to grapple with as a, as a people and as a church. What are some of the other causes of, of, of a church that's struggling with this particular belief? Another cause is we have a church that's drifting from its historical foundations. Other people say that there's apostasy in the church. There's things taking place that, that no longer reflect where we should stand as a people, in our lifestyle, in our beliefs, and so on. So much so that it, it's, it shouldn't even be called the remnant church today. You have factions maybe on the far right that say that. That it's gone too far, that it no longer can hold a claim to be called that. Standards are being lowered. The spirituality is superficial. When you look at the statistics of those who read their Bibles on a daily basis or those who pray on a daily basis, it's shockingly low. People no longer really understand who we are and what we believe. And then in the last 15 years of world history, we have another challenge that we have faced, and that is this, the impact of social media. How has social media impacted the concept of the remnant? Well, it's, it, it's an interesting concept, but social media has connected our lives. We're now friends with people that we were never friends with before. In, in, in this sense, you know, you may have known someone who was an Adventist who was in church, and then they left church. And then when they left church, you never saw them again. Like you didn't see them again because they've left. But now we're friends on social media. And now we still see the path of their life. We still see the journey that they've taken. We still see what they post. And, and sometimes people post thoughts or ideas that may challenge where they previously held. They may raise questions about how they used to believe, and that therefore then puts questions in other people's minds. We are now more aware of what our friends, family, and contemporaries are doing, thinking, and feeling. And if those friends have issues or questions about their church or their belief system, they are generally speaking out through social media. People's Facebook status are, I don't believe in this, or I don't agree with that, and, and that doesn't seem right. And in the comment section on any particular post, it just kind of goes crazy. And it causes, notice the last sentence there, it causes people who might otherwise, who might, sorry, it causes people who might not otherwise have questions or issues to suddenly start asking some of the hard questions. People that didn't used to have questions are now asking some of the hard questions that other people are asking, meaning that some of these difficult questions are being asked across the board, the status gets shared, the tweet gets retweeted, and, and all of a sudden people have questions about something they, they, they never would have questioned before. And so social media has, in a sense, intensified, and what would I say, intensified the questioning and highlighted, it's highlighted the lack of biblical literacy amongst our people. It's highlighted it. Because if people had a level of biblical literacy, some of these questions they would not have. And they would be answered. 
Some of the Adventists are no longer, as I mentioned before, biblical literature, no longer able to defend the faith as they previously have been able to defend the faith. The level of biblical literacy is not really there. And now we, we just look to one or two members of a congregation, the one or two elders who really know their Bibles or, or the pastor or, or some of the people who are really competent. They're the ones who are the warriors on behalf of the people. But the idea of the average layman being able to defend who they are and, and, and what they believe, those that idea is kind of over. That idea is kind of gone. Social media has impacted our world in ways that we could never have imagined um, before. And so all of these aspects have to be taken into account when we, we think about um, the idea as to the SDA church being a remnant church anymore. Now, let me just go back to sharing my screen again. Um, Some of the new issues that have come up today are largely driven by an evangelical critique. So as a church, we're getting criticized by the evangelicals. Remember, we're looking at this question of a unique responsibility. Who are we as a church today? These issues are driven by an evangelical critique where the evangelicals are looking at us and saying that that, that, that message is, is not biblical. But the problem is, if we have been trained in the schools of evangelical thought, it's very difficult for us to then defend the points that the evangelicals are criticizing us on. Salvation by works is one of the critiques of the Adventist church. You believe in legalism. You believe, and maybe that's part of the argument could be true in some, in some aspect that the way we have presented our doctrines in the past is, is quite legalistic you could argue the idea of the sabbath being this mark of uniqueness or this mark of um extra uh, there's extra special um purpose to believing in the sabbath is criticized by evangelicals they say now it's more about jesus not about the day you worship him. this idea that we have an extra biblical prophet of, of, of ellen white is another argument that's been criticized heavily by the evangelical world and it doesn't help when some of the adventists are not able to defend their beliefs biblically when we don't have the level of biblical literacy to defend what we believe and too many seventh day adventists today they use the writings of ellen white to defend why they believe in the sabbath or the sanctuary or the great controversy or the second coming because it's so much easier to take a paragraph as a quotation than it is to actually take someone through a bible study and and if we don't have the biblical literacy to use the bible but we're using as a crutch quotations and statements from Ellen White to show what we believe, it lends itself to this argument that we have this extra biblical prophet. The fallout of our own theological debates of the 1980s and 90s when we had the Desmond Ford crisis in the early 80s and, and, and so on was a new generation that is uncertain about its faith and is not well equipped to respond to the evangelical critique. You put all this together and you've got a perfect storm. You've got attacks on us as a church. You've got questions. You've got doubt. You've got people who are unsure. You've got a desire to be accepted. You've got an unclear identity. You put all of that together and it's not a, it's not a, a good outlook. We're here with a unique responsibility to share a message to the world. And yet, and yet today, we're coming from a church that has been attacked, a, a church that has questions, a church that has doubts, a church that's unsure, a church with a desire to be accepted, and a church that's unclear about its identity. Revelation 12, verses 13 to 17, I believe, in the book of Revelation, outlines clearly some of the identifying features of the remnant church to show who it is and who it is and why it's been raised. In Revelation 12 verse 13 to 17, we have there in verse 14, there within that package a a woman. The Bible says a woman who has fled into the wilderness. 
for a time, times, and half a time. This gives us a time prophecy. Uh, we understand that in Bible prophecy that a woman represents a church in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 14, and in Jeremiah 6, verse 2. Though Those are two of the verses, probably two of the clearest verses, though there are other ones in Ephesians 5 and other places that indicate that a woman in Bible prophecy is symbolic of a church. So when we have a woman fleeing into the wilderness for this particular time period, a time, times, and half a time, we have to ask ourselves, well, this is a symbolic verse. This woman or this church has gone to the wilderness for this length of time. Is it a literal time or a symbolic time? And you start to realize that this time period of, of a time, times, and half a time, which I believe in verse 6 of chapter 12, is outlined as 1,260 days, is a prophetic time period. A time is a year. A times would be two years or more, but we'll take it as two, and half a times is half a year. In Bible times, a year was 360 days in the Hebrew calendar. It was, it's not the 365 we have today. Uh, a month had 30 days, and 12 times 30 is 360. A year was 360 days. So when you have a year being 360, two years being 720, and half a year being 180, it adds up to 1,260 days. The woman, the church, flees into the wilderness for 1,260 days. But we also see another principle of Bible prophecy, and that is in Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 6, and Numbers 14, verse 34, that a, a day in Bible prophecy represents one year. A day represents one year. Numbers 14, 34, we get the story of the children of Israel who sent the spies into the land and they went there and they came back with a negative report. And when they came back with a, a, a negative report, um, God punished them, so to speak. He said, because you've come back with this negative report, you will now have to go into the wilderness and wander in the wilderness. One year for every day the spies were in the land. We know the spies were in the land for 40 days. And so the children of Israel had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years in the wilderness, 40 years. When we put all this together, we have the Adventist, we, we have a woman going into the wilderness for 1,260 years. This time period comes up several other times in the Bible. We have a time, time, and dividing of times in Daniel 7, verse 25. We have a time, times, and half a time in Daniel 12, verse 7. We have Revelation 11, verse 2, where it's 42 months at the same time. Revelation 11, verse 3, where it's 1,260 days. We have Revelation 12, verse 6, where it's 1,260 days. We have a time, times, and half a time. We have 42 months in Revelation 13 and verse 5. It's all the same time period. And so when we have this woman in the wilderness for a time, times, and half a time, a time, times, and half a time, we know this time period was a prophetic time. It's a 1,260-year 1, prophecy, which we believe was the time period when the Roman Catholic Church was a joint religious political power, which goes from 538 to 1798. This is the period of Rome's rule as this power. So this idea of the remnant in Revelation 12, we see one of the identifying features of the remnant is that it comes out of hiding after 1798. Meaning if the woman is hiding in the wilderness or has fled to the wilderness for a time, time and half a times, or has fled to the wilderness for 1260 years, or has fled to the wilderness for 42 months, same time period, the woman is in hiding from 538 to 1798. Therefore, showing us this idea of the remnant, that the remnant church would arise after 1798. Therefore, when we're looking for the idea of the remnant, we're not looking to one of the mainstream evangelical or one of the mainstream Protestant churches, which arose in the 1500s or the 1600s or the 1700s or, or, or so on. But we're looking at a church that arises after 1798. In verse 16 of chapter 17, the Bible says that the earth helps the woman. The earth helps the woman. In Revelation 13 and verse 11, the Bible tells it uses the symbology of the earth as being opposite of the sea in, in verse 1 of chapter 13. In chapter 13, verse 1, you have a beast rising from the sea. In chapter 13, verse 11, you've got a beast rising from the earth. The earth and sea are opposite. 
in the Bible, seas represent multitudes, peoples, nations, and tongues in Revelation 17, verse 15. The earth is therefore the opposite. <coughs> the earth, I believe, in the context of Revelation 12 and verse 13, is, and we don't have time to do the full Bible study, is the United States of America. In Revelation 12, in Revelation 12, verse 14, you've got the woman fleeing to the wilderness and is in hiding from 538 to 1798. Any church that arising during that time period is not the remnant church because the woman was in hiding. Then you have the earth helping the woman. Meaning after 1798, I believe the United States of America, a nation that was founded in 1776 on the ideals of religious freedom would arise as a haven for the woman to find a place of refuge. And in the context of these two chapters, it is represented by the United States of America. So the, the remnant church would arise on the, content, on the continent of the Americas. And verse 17 gives us two more identifying marks of this remnant church. In verse 17, it says that the woman would keep the commandments of God. We know from James 2 verse 10, you've got to keep all of them. Exodus 20, verse 8 to 11 talks about the Sabbath and so on. It's got to be a church that keeps all the commandments, including the Sabbath commandment. And it also says in Revelation 12, verse 17, that they would have the testimony of Jesus. When we look at Revelation 19, 10 and Revelation 22, verse 9, we see that these two verses combine together to show it's not the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, which is given to the church through prophets. So just in Revelation 12, we've got a church that would arise after 1798. We've got a church that would arise in the United States of America. And we've got a church that would keep the commandments of God and a church that would have the testimony of Jesus or the gift of prophecy. And when you look at the mainstream denominations in the last 200 years, you have the Mormon church, you have the uh, Jehovah's Witness church, and you have the Seventh-day Adventist church. All arose in America. All arose after 1798. All of claims to have the prophetic gift, but I believe of those three denominations, only one, only one of them actually keeps the Sabbath or all the commandments. The Adventist church, I believe, is the remnant church of Bible prophecy. I believe when you look at Revelation 12 and you identify who the woman of Revelation 12 verse 17 is in the context of verse 16 and verse 15 and verse 14 and verse 13, I believe you can come to no other conclusion that the remnant church, the woman of Revelation 17 is at the end there, is the Seventh-day Adventist church. I believe you have to come to that conclusion. Prophetically, we have an identity. Prophetically, we have a place and we need to understand we keep the commandments of God and we have the testimony of Jesus. And then as we go on in Revelation chapter 14, we see in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 6 that the, Advent, uh, <laughs> the remnant church would be preaching the everlasting gospel to all the world. The remnant church would preach the everlasting gospel to all the world and put two and two together. Only a worldwide movement can preach a message to all the world. It makes sense. You can't preach a message to all the world if your church organization is limited to, to Norway. You can't preach a message to all the world if your church organization is limited to United Kingdom. You can't preach a message to all the world if you're limited to a particular geographic region. But if you are spread out across the world, if you do understand the purpose of mission to go into all the world, then you can preach a message to all the world. In Revelation 14 and verse 6, as I mentioned, we have this everlasting gospel that is preached in all the world. And what does the everlasting gospel look like? Just to break it down. What does it look like? What is the uniqueness even here in Revelation 14 that if you look out across the spread of Christianity, I'm going to say something here as well. I'm going to come back to this point. As an Adventist church, we do not believe in a list of doctrinal beliefs. We do not. Let me say that again. As an Adventist church, we do not believe in a list of doctrinal beliefs. We don't. It's different. And I'm going to come back to this point. We do not believe in a list of doctrinal beliefs. But when you look at Revelation 14, verse 6 to 15, 
the Bible says that the, the, the people of God in, Re in Revelation 14, verse 7, it says that if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. Revelation 14 and verse 7. The Bible says, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made the heavens and the earth, the sea and the fountains of water. In Revelation 14, verse 7, you have four areas of focus. Fear God. I believe if we were to do a Bible study, that's looking at obedience. It's looking at respect and reverence of God. And I believe there is an element in that we should fear who God is as well, but that's not obviously the main, the main purpose. And then the Bible says, give glory to him. Give glory to him, I believe, in First, uh, first Corinthians uh, chapter 6. I forget the verse off the top of my head. First Corinthians chapter 6, where it says, no, chapter 10, actually, verse, I believe it's verse 13. In whatever you eat or whatever you drink or in whatever you do across the board, it says, give glory to God. Give glory to God. And I believe that's not just our eating and our drinking, but it's our Christian lifestyle. In everything we do about who we are as a person, we should give glory to God. It says, for the hour of his judgment is come, the sanctuary message, and worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the fountains, and the springs of waters, and so on. It's a direct quotation from the fourth commandment. So then Revelation 14, verse 7, you've got obedience, you've got Christian lifestyle, you've got the sanctuary message, and you've got the Sabbath. This is a unique message. Not just anyone can preach this message. And you can't just take one aspect. And, it, and when we look at Christianity today, there are, there are elements in Christianity that, that preach one aspect. You've got Christian churches that believe in having a holistic lifestyle. Or you've got Christian churches that believe in a very, you could say, conservative view of, of how they should live their lives. But, but they don't have the sanctuary message or they don't have the Sabbath uh, combined there as well. And the sanctuary gives us that unique purpose as to why we do things because it gives us an eschatological or an end time framework for when these events will take place revelation 14 verse 8 talks about how babylon has fallen part of the responsibility and this is probably the part that's one of the hardest today it's one thing to say you are right which is increasingly difficult in the world today it's one thing to say we are the remnant, which is increasingly hard in a postmodern society where everyone's right. But it's another thing, and it's even harder to say you're wrong, because we live in an age where people don't want to be, uh, they don't want the finger pointed at them. They don't want to be uh, identified as being anything but, 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 but right. And so I, identifying that Babylon is wrong and identifying who Babylon is is a problem is a problem today. The Bible goes on to say that they would keep the commandments of God in verse 12, that they would have the faith of Jesus. We see all of these aspects there in Revelation chapter 14. Revelation 14 verses 6 to 15, and then it goes on to talk about blessed are the dead that they may rest from their labors, uh, as though it's not necessarily part of the of the three angels message per se it's still included there uh, and it has a doctrinal relevance and then it talks about the second coming when jesus comes with a sickle to reap in the earth these are all aspects i believe of the three angels message or the message entrusted to us as a church to identify who babylon is to keep the commandments of god to have the faith of jesus to understand what the state of the dead is to understand the second coming the sabbath the sanctuary christian lifestyle and obedience to god all of them come together as a tidy package unfortunately today people may understand a little bit about the second coming and they may they may understand the sabbath and uh, and that may be where it ends that may be where it ends the rest of it Maybe I was told once, but I don't even really understand it. And I couldn't explain it to somebody else. I could not explain it to somebody else. But this, though, is the everlasting gospel to be preached in all the world. Revelation 14, verse 6 is clear. I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. This is the message that will go to all the world. Therefore, as a people, we must understand this message. A unique responsibility. We're not just here to be another, uh, so to speak, um, you know, social service. 
it's important to feed the sick and care for the needy and, and, and so on. But as part of that, or you could say above and beyond that, we have a message that must be shared. And there's a reason why we have a message that must be shared. I said earlier that we don't have a list of doctrinal beliefs. And I'll say that again, and I'm going to explain why I said what I said. We don't have a list of doctrinal beliefs as a church. We have what I describe as a system. If I could illustrate, well, I, I should have put a picture on the screen. A system where you've got all of these things that are kind of interconnected. It's not just a linear group. You've got all of these ideas that are interconnected, uh, where, where the, the beliefs of the Adventist church or the I believe the beliefs of the Bible, the Bible makes complete sense, where each doctrine is interlinked with another one, where the belief on the second coming is interlinked with the belief on the state of the dead. It makes sense. It makes sense. When Jesus comes, he will resurrect those who died, the righteous. It makes sense. It makes sense. You go to a funeral in a, in a, in a pr uh, Protestant church, and it's confusing. They will say that so-and-so is in heaven. Okay. But you're sitting there looking at the coffin in the church. So that doesn't make sense. And then they say so-and-so is in heaven, but we look forward to the resurrection when they're going to be raised up from the dead. Well, how can they be raised up from the dead if they're already dead? It makes no logical sense. Our belief on the second coming is, is verified by our belief in the, what shall I say? Uh, second coming is verified belief in the state of the dead, which matches with our belief on the millennium, that the, the, the righteous are resurrected at the beginning of the millennium and the wicked are resurrected at the end of the millennium. And the millennium matches with our belief in, 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 the, in the sanctuary, our belief in the sanctuary that, that in the uh, sanctuary system, there's this idea of vindication. And at the end of the thousand years, there's going to be a vindication of God and, and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. But, at the, but then at the end of the thousand years, this, there's this idea of this ultimate eradication of the wicked. The belief system, it all works together. It's not a list. You take out one of them and then there's a problem. It all falls. It, it, it's got to be together that each one supports the other. And it's not a list, but rather it's a system. It's not like, oh, we got 28. And I just don't believe in number 20, 24. No, they all play together. They all play a role together. They all play a role together. You may have heard the phrase, a picture tells a thousand words. A picture tells a thousand words. And I believe the the picture, so to speak, of the, the Adventist church has been raised up to, to have this idea that what we share to the world, maybe doctrinally, is a system, not a list. But then marry that idea of a system, not a list, with the idea that a picture tells a thousand words and, 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 and matching the, the things up together is that the, the belief system of the Adventist church, I believe, portrays a picture of God that is only seen when we have this doctrinal understanding as to all the doctrines. This idea that doctrines and Jesus are not combined is foolishness. It's, it's just theologically incorrect. It's because it's through the doctrinal system that we have an understanding of the character of God. And we get a clearer understanding of the who God is and who Jesus is when we understand the doctrines. Because they reveal the character of God. We understand about the justice of God. We understand the justice of God when we see uh, the millennium doctrine. We understand the fairness of God when we see the judgment. We understand the, the, the pain of the heart of God, even with destroying the wicked when we see hell fire. And when we put all these together, we understand a little bit more about who God is. But also, it's not just that. It's through the sanctuary system that we see a full understanding of God. And we see a full understanding of salvation. Because the concept of the judgment and the concept of, of fairness and the concept of, of um, paying for your sins, the concept of all of these kind of deep concepts such as grace, unmerited favor, the concept of um, 
the concept of being justified, the concept of, of, um, of being cleansed, all of these aspects of salvation, we see them illustrated in the sanctuary. And overriding with the judgment kind of playing a role there. Too often Christianity today has an understanding of the gospel removed from the judgment. Together they must play a role. Justice and mercy have kissed themselves. And they've met. And they meet in the sanctuary. The Adventist church with its understanding on the sanctuary gives it a unique understanding of the character of God. And it brings everything together. You could say there are two overriding motifs in Adventism. We have the sanctuary motif where we understand our doctrines through this realm of the sanctuary. And we have the great controversy motif, where we understand that there's this great controversy battle going on for the vindication of God in this world today. These two overriding themes, we see them being played out. And I believe the Adventist church is, is unique in its understanding of the sanctuary, and is unique in its understanding of the great controversy which are overriding themes to any doctrinal discussion. Any discussion about the purpose of Adventism is played there. Now, what is the mission and the purpose of the Adventist church today? Adventism is not called to offer people, so to speak, the assurance of salvation. Adventism is not there to, for the ministry of the spirit and nurturing and caring for his church, you could argue that these were established without the need for the Adventist church. The mission of the Adventist church in Revelation 14, verse 6 and verse 7, these verses came about, or they, say that they are to be interpreted, so to speak, at the same time as Adventism came on the scene. What is the mission and what is the purpose of the Adventist church? To preach the everlasting gospel into all the world. What is the everlasting gospel? Revelation 14 verse 7. I saw another angel saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him. The great controversy today, Satan has made great advances with, with, with Old Testament people and, and with those since new, you know, in the Old Testament, there's this idea that God is this vengeful, fearful God. And in the New Testament, this idea that I can do something to assist in this plan of salvation, both of these ideas are theologically wrong. Both of these ideas are theologically wrong. And the Adventist church, I believe, is raised up to marry correctly. What is the view of God in the Old Testament? What is the view of God in the New Testament? How do we see the great controversy playing throughout? both the New and the Old Testament, to give us a clearer picture as to who God is and what is our purpose today. What is the mission and purpose of the Adventist church? One of the key texts we use as a church is Daniel chapter 8, verse 13 and 14, where a question is asked, Lord, how long? Lord, how long? And part of the response to the question, Lord, how long? Lord, how long will this take place? The answer is given, until 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Part of the answer, and, and this text is key in our, in our theological heritage. It's key in our historical identity because it played a role in the great disappointment. It played a role into how our church formed uh, with an understanding of the sanctuary. And, and, and that, in order to understand, you could say, our responsibility, you've got to understand some of our historical identity. William Miller debated long onto the interpretation of the text of Daniel chapter 8, verse 14. He debated long and hard about that. Long and hard. Long and hard. Now, how has God been vindicated? Jesus showed that, that, that God's law is good and his character is love. But, but all heaven, it says in uh, Review and Herald, April the 16th, 1901, is waiting to hear us vindicate God's law. There's this idea that I believe we find in scripture, that there's this great controversy between Christ and Satan. The accusation of Satan to Christ is 
that the requirements, so to speak, for want of a better term, that God required of Satan were unjust and unfair. That Satan has been removed from heaven, that Satan has been kicked out of heaven unjustly and unfairly. And part of the response of God to, to vindicate his fairness and his justice is to show and to illustrate that what he required of Satan is not something that is, is uh, unique, it's not something that is uh, unreasonable, it's not something that is difficult because. There will be a people on earth that also fulfill and live up to what Christ has asked of them. And in a sense, they vindicate God in this battle of the great controversy between Christ and Satan. Christ's Object Lessons, page 65, 69, it says, Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. Desire of Ages, page 671, it says, the honor of God, the honor of Christ is involved in the perfection of the character of his people the honor of god the honor of christ is involved in the perfection of the character of his people this idea that god his honor the honor of god the the, the family name or, or whatever you want to call it the honor of god is connected to his people that his people can restore the honor of god because there's this battle in the great controversy the honor of his throne is staked for the fulfillment of his word unto us Desire of Ages, page 763, it says, every character will be fully developed and all will show whether they have chosen the side of loyalty or that of rebellion. Then the end will come. God will vindicate his law and deliver his people. God will vindicate his law and deliver his people. Now, the likeness, I believe, of the SDA church, and you can find some understanding or some or some idea that there's a connection between how Israel was viewed in the Old Testament raised up for a particular purpose there was nothing special about them but rather it was a responsibility that was given them to then share the message around to the nation they did not fulfill that mission they did not live up to that and they kind of just became the special people that prided themselves on being special and did not share the truth entrusted to them with other people and you can see a likeness in that today where we as an Adventist church can be, um, we can slip into this trap where we think, oh, we're special, or we think, oh, we're unique, or we think, oh, we're different. And rather than focusing on the purpose as to why God has entrusted that with us, we just focus on the reality itself. The reality itself. Desire of Ages, page 680, Christ designs that heaven's order, heaven's plan of government, heaven's divine harmony shall be represented in his church on earth. Thus, notice here, in his people, he is glorified. In his who? In his people. In his people, he is glorified. Manuscript releases number 30, 1900 says, God's people have a great work to do. The world must see in the church of God, true order, true discipline, true organization. God's people have a work to do because the world needs to see not the order for the sake of order, but the world needs to see a people, a people that are unique, a people that are representing God, a people that are vindicating God in the world today through the church eventually will be made manifest the final and full display of the love of God to the world that is to be lightened with his glory. God is planning to use through the church a display of what? It does not say a display of doctrinal um, intelligence. It says a display of the love of God. But I would argue that we only have a full display, so to speak, of the love of God. There could be an argument. We only have a full display of the love of God in its fullness as we completely understand who God is 
and we have a complete understanding of who God is when we see it all combined together, which is seen in its beauty through the doctrinal understanding. There's a quotation here I'm going to read. It says, music is made up of three parts. The melody, the rhythm, and accompaniment. And all three are essential, but not of equal importance. The melody should have the most prominent part and should not be overshadowed by the rhythm or the accompaniment, read it, reading on. The um, evangelization of the world by means of extensive preaching, teaching, and printed propaganda, and the expenditure of large sums of money for campaigns, buildings, equipment, travel, etc. Vital though these are, uh, do not in and of themselves fulfill the principal commission entrusted to the remnant church. These are not the melody at the most. They are the what? Accompaniment. So the preaching, the teaching, the, the printed material, the buildings, the campaign, the travel, that should not be the main part. They are just the accompaniment. What's the main part? What's the main part? What's the main part? The melody, which is to ring forth, sketchily at first, but every more, but <laughs> every more clearly, is the song of victory over sin. The song of Moses, the Lamb, soaring higher and higher, closer and ever closer to the heavenly pattern, further and further away from the world, to the climactic height of a full and final display of the his grace in vessels of clay, but divested of all earthliness and testified unto by the declaration of the angel. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. For the first time, this testimony will be said of the whole community of saints. What is the purpose of the unique responsibility of the church today? Primarily, it is not the preaching of the message verbally verbally the primary mission of the church is the vindication of god accomplished through the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary and us allowing christ to cleanse the sanctuary of our hearts that's the primary mission of the church the vindication of god accomplished through the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary and us allowing him to cleanse the sanctuary of our hearts and in doing so we're vindicating God. What's the secondary mission? The worldwide mission and outreach to Bible studies and soul winning. Primarily, let me just go back. Primarily, primarily, our mission as a remnant church is the vindication of God. Allowing him to cleanse the sanctuary of our hearts. Allowing us to be a representation of Christ here on this earth secondary 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 our secondary mission is the worldwide mission and outreach through bible studies and soul winning these two things combined the primary and the secondary show the unique responsibility that god has given to us today which prove and show that not just any denomination so to speak can be the woman of Revelation 17. Not just any people can be that woman of Revelation 17 that is raised up at the end of time to play a unique purpose. This church that is raised up after 1798, this church that is raised up in America, the church that believes in the commandments of God, the church that believes in, in, in the gift of prophecy, the church that believes the Revelation 14 message that will go to all the world, the message that we must preach, but it's not just a verbal ascent to the knowledge. It's not just having more satellites. It's not just having more YouTube pages. It's not just having more Facebook pages to preach the message, but ultimately it's having a, a living connection with Christ. It's having a, uh, um, being able to share through our life and vindicating God as a people, not just individually, but collectively here on earth to the world prior to the return of Jesus. We have a unique, a unique, a unique message. And I pray that you are part of this movement. I pray that you are part of this people. And I pray that you are part of this church. 
and that we're not ashamed. We're not ashamed of who we are, that we're not ashamed of being part of a, a, a worldwide movement with a unique message at the end of time. And that we're faithful to our duty as Seventh Day Adventists today, a unique responsibility God has given to us, and that we may share it faithfully, that we may share it faithfully. The God needs young people today. God needs you. He needs you to be a part of this movement, not just to be, uh, not just to be someone who knows, but someone who lives and someone who does. It's the combination of all three. I know the truth. I live the truth and I share the truth in the world today. All of those aspects combining and working together that we as a church, that we as a church may take this message to all the world. May God help us. May God help us to be true to our duty. Europe needs people today in our postmodern, post-truth world that understand who they are, the heritage that we have, and why we share. Let's pray. Father in heaven, bless us as a people. Bless us to be able to share this message to the world. Give us a clearer understanding as to who we are. That it's not just for us to preach, it's for us to live and vindicate. Amen.